Hi everyone, welcome to Offside's um, Extend to Hope lecture podcast episode. Uh, we have a few people here with us uh, starting today, and then we have a wonderful speaker, uh, Robin Hansen, uh, who is here on the interview uh, interviewee chair. It's definitely not your first time, Robin. I uh, find it almost hard to count the many times that we've interviewed you. So thank you so, so much for coming back. Um, you're a honorary senior fellow at Foresight now, and I must say, I think you've been around Foresight much, much longer than I have been. Um, I, I'm, I'm old. Yeah, well, no, no, not old. You're just very <laughs> experienced. One of the first things I found in our archives when I looked was that you and Chris Hibbert, I think, led a prediction market in our 1999 member gathering. Um, and I think people literally voted by sending checks to our offices afterwards. So, <laughs> um, but it was really fun claims in there. Uh, I have a few of them locked away, um, but eventually we should uh, write them out again. You know, that's kind of like what your phase where you a pioneer prediction market. And that was definitely not the only thing you pioneered. You also were, I think, quite infamous or famous for your home debate with Elia Zajukowski on different approaches to AI and different takeoff speeds. In addition to that, you wrote Age of M which is a really wonderful, mind-boggling book about the world in which brain emulations rule the world. Uh, you also wrote Elephant in the Brain, uh, which uh, I think became like a magical success. Um, and, you know, really pointing out a few of our biases that, um, uh, that, that we're prone to and why we do the things that we do um, and why we tell ourselves that we do them for different reasons. Um, and you have a wonderful, wonderful blog, Overcoming Bias, uh, all of it is not even uh, speaking about your academic career yet, uh, whatsoever. Uh, and then recently, you wrote another book, <laughs> or in the process there, Query Aliens, which uh, already has made a lot of, uh, in German we say, over, like a lot of, has had a lot of um, attention uh, without it ever, yeah, uh, without, I think, it probably being published yet. So really, really, really excited. It was published. <laughs> It was published. The Graphic Aliens paper was published in Astrophysical Journal uh, last year. Yes. So, which is yes. a top astrophysics journal. So, that's some degree. That's of... true. But I read, I think, part of the draft for the very longer book. And that, I think, is not out yet. Is that correct? Right. That's correct. Okay. But for people that are interested, there's already the website, gravyaliens.com. So, if they want to just more, know more about the concept, there's a video on it and there's the paper and so forth. Okay. Very cool. So, now I think people at least have an understanding that you're a jack of all trades. And so when we uh, get into the nitty gritty questions, your answers may be a little bit more contextualized because you probably can speak about a variety of different things. So thank you so, so much for being here. Um, okay, let's get this started. Uh, in a nutshell, um, what are you working on? <laughs> or what's the number one thing you want to point out to us? And kind of what got you on that path? Uh, I think you have a really interesting life history that should be rather relevant for younger folks entering the space. So, I'm pretty opportunistic about my intellectual strategies for a long time. I changed fields several times. So I started in engineering and then I switched to physics. And then I, after getting a master's in physics, I switched to philosophy of science. And then I uh, went into computer science for nine years at Lockheed and NASA doing Bayesian statistics and artificial intelligence. And then I went back to school in social science at Caltech and did a two-year postdoc in health policy and got my job here as an now a tenured professor of economics at George Mason University, where I did stuff on information aggregation, uh, prediction markets, um, a wide range of other sort of, you know, theoretic and institution design and economics and um, sort of radical changes we could all make that I'm still very excited about. And uh, along the way, this book on futurism, this book on psychology, the elephant in the brain, the new book on um, aliens. Uh, so, you know, my, my fundamental strategy is to uh, first just learn a lot of tools and look for opportunities to combine them, you know, look for things that are neglected and uh, to hold myself to the standard of staying in something long enough to make progress, <laughs> staying in something long enough to uh, actually um, you know, make a real contribution to that field. Uh, I think if you're going to be a dilettante doing lots of different things, that should be the standard you hold yourself to is uh, stay in something long enough to uh, actually contribute. And so I, I will defend that standard with respect to each of the topics we could talk about here. And I'm still not sure which way we're going. Uh, but I, I, I should say to several people on the audience, uh, Gail, I haven't seen you in a very long time. Uh, Fred, I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, and, and welcome to all the rest of you, uh, Tad, 
That sounds like a familiar name to me. I, I must have talked to you before in a while. And uh, Rudy, of course, I, I customer of yours long ago, probably still. Anyway, nice to see you all. Wonderful. Um, okay, perhaps we dig a little bit deeper in a few of the field. Um, if you could just give an overview for maybe young, talented folks, like, you know, entering one of the areas that you're focused on right now, uh, what could they be aware of? Like, what's a good bird's eye overview? Um, maybe, you know, if you could give a quick one uh, of the variety. Overview of a field, the... huh? Yes, a bird's eye so, overview of so, many um, different fields. Okay. I'll, I'll just pick one somewhat at random, I guess. Um, you're probably excited by technology, right? Uh, foresight is related to technology and you're tracking technology and seeing that technology is improving and you're interested in where it can improve the most. Um, honestly, your, your thing, like these are young people. I'm not really seeing that in terms of the median age here, by the way, but I, I can still pitch uh, these, these are not young people starting their career, but the videos, if it, it, it goes out, maybe young people will see that later. Um, but, um. Technology in general is just an arrangement of things that's useful. And tech, the concept of technology applies to social arrangements. <laughs> and that was a key idea that engaged me long ago was that you could do innovation in social arrangements as well as innovation in you know, physical devices or software. And I got interested in looking into that and realized there's just, it seems to be there's enormous potential there. <laughs> that is, seems to be easy to come across ideas of different social arrangements that would be vastly more productive than we have. And it seems easier to do that than in physics, engineering, and computer science, where, you know, it's really hard to come up with better things. Um, and so that's what tempted me to become a social scientist in the first place, is seeing what looked like a lot of easy wins. And the thing I didn't notice that maybe I sh you should notice is that the reason why it's easy to find big wins is that they just sit there for decades, not being taken. Whereas in computer science and physical devices, people see a win and they take it. And then the next person has to beat that as a win and that gets harder. So the lesson is that for social innovation, uh, it's actually relatively easy to come up with things that are better. The hard part is to get anybody to care. The hard part is to find somebody somewhere willing to say, to try your innovation, to, to work it out. So, I mean, also a standard thing, if you don't know, all innovation is a combination of some simple, elegant ideas and a bunch of messy details <laughs> and academics like where I am like to talk about the elegant, elegant ideals and they will, you know, write a paper on those, maybe do some simple game theory model lab experiments to explore an elegant idea. And that's where they drop it because they don't get credit for doing the next messy detail part. But if you actually want to have an effect on the world through social innovation, you have to find somebody to continue on with the messy details. That is, you have to get some social environment where people are willing to try things. And then you have to try things and watch and learn and repeat to, you know, to eventually feel something so that you can succeed in one place and then convince other people to try and succeed other ways. And that's sort of the general recipe for innovation. And a lot of people, including you young people, love to sit around at parties and talk about all the great ideas for how the world should be approved. But then you lose interest when it comes to actually doing a concrete trial of something, actually trying something, um, because that's kind of boring and messy. You'd rather, uh, you know, give talks on it or join a, work thinking group about it or, you know, find a job about it or, you know, get a major in it and write an academic paper in it. Those are the things that engage people. And Go on a the thing that's missing is the trials. Do some trials. Yeah. Okay. I think that I remember you once mentioning just as an example that the fact that you, uh, you were rather hopeful that prediction markets would get picked up. And then after a while you would decide, hmm, well, that would actually mean accountability for a few people. <laughs> Um, and I think that partly what motivated you to write Elephant in the Brain was this kind of realization that what we say we want is not uh, always really uh, what we actually want. Is that roughly correct? Well, certainly seeing the contrast between the kind of innovations people say they're interested in and the kinds they actually are willing to put some energy and try is a data point about how the world isn't what it seems. And that was important in pushing me to think about hidden motives, the way that the idea that we were just wrong about why we do things, we're not self-aware. 
of our motives in a lot of various, including with respect to social institutions. Cool. Okay. We'll leave it at that. At least, you know, we have a, a bit of an example here. So now, uh, to make it even harder, um, if you consider maybe one of the different domains that, you know, you've contributed to, um, were there any exciting cultural shifts that uh, you think really, uh, men, well, that really make people within that domain change their mind? Um, and maybe, I mean, if you, if you dare, you could maybe do that for AI. You could maybe do that uh, for, you know, economics. You could maybe do that for social science and maybe even for the more spacefaring uh, gravy aliens. Then. If you could please, or pick one of them. Well, um, look, the world of ideas follows a lot of fashion. That is, if something's been popular for a while, then the world is kind of itching to change their mind and make something else popular because they're just an old generation has gotten their name on the old thing. And there's a new generation looking to make, make themselves on something else. And so there's just this general demand for changing priorities in the intellectual world. And so, uh, you know, obviously people are always trying to guess what that might be and to jump on that. So I have certainly seen change priorities over time. I think you're asking me for a change priority I can endorse and praise. So honestly, like almost as often when fashion changes, I go, oh, that was the wrong way. Uh, I wish it would have, you know, gone more the other direction, but certainly half the time, the direction at least is in the direction I praise. Uh, so, you know, the things that stayed out most to me are of course, the things that I made a bet early on about it deserved more attention and then it turned out the world gave it more attention. <laughs> so prediction markets are an example of that where the world was initially pretty skeptical. And then, oh, you know, I happened to start talking about them earlier, just before lots of other people did, and they got more interested. And I think that was great. Although of course it's still mostly academic talk <laughs> rather than, uh, organizational application. Um, another area is say the great filter. <laughs> Uh, clearly there were people thinking about what they call the Fermi paradox and things like that a while ago, but there weren't that many. And it's just seemed to me really important and I couldn't understand why other people weren't more obsessed with it. So I just took some time off from my, a uh, postdoc career at the time <laughs> to think about and write about, um, the great filter. And, you know, that phrase took off, it caught on. And so now, uh, people will just rely, regularly use the phrase, the great filters nearly as often as they would use. Could you explain as one sentence that is what it is for anyone who doesn't know? Right. Right. So the, the Fermi paradox you might say is where is everybody? <laughs> and there's lots of life down here and you look up the universe and everything just looks completely dead and empty. And, um, you ask why. And so the Fermi, the great filter is a way of rearranging that question, just asking in a different way, which is to say. Well, there's this process that starts from simple dead matter and slowly, you know, simple life evolves and more complicated life evolves, and then eventually it reaches to what we are. And that process could happen anywhere. And it did happen here, but clearly it didn't happen a lot of other places. <laughs> so clearly the overall rate of transformation from simple dead matter to stuff at our level, if that makes sense, is very low which is to say there is a great filter between that and this, that we think of, you know, something having to pass through a filter to get past, you know, filters, a 90% filter was saying filter out 90% of what tries to go in and only that 10% go out. Well, of all these dead planets that start out, you know, that filter might be a factor of 10 to the 20 in terms of how few reach our level. And our gravity aliens analysis was finally actually to give numbers to that. We were able to say, our best estimate is that advanced life that would become gravity that we hope to, we are quite there, but the rate at which that happens is roughly once per million galaxies. Okay. And, a word and, about and we, what does gravity mean? So, so the, the key idea is that, um, you know, alien civilizations might appear in many places and some of them would be quiet. They would just not last for a while and not do very much and be hard to see from a long way. But there's this other kind is just really hard to miss. Why? Because they start expanding from their source. They just keep expanding and don't stop. And they change their volumes inside of where they control. And then from a long distance, it's just going to be obvious that something has changed. That's the kind of thing we can say we don't see. We can't say we're much confidence how many 
quiet ones aren't out there because it's hard to see a quiet one. But we can say we don't see any of these loud ones. And in fact, that's enough to figure out their rate in space time. So we have a simple model of Rabelians and how where they appear in space time uh, has three parameters. Each of the parameters can be fit to data. And so it gives us these answers that they appear roughly once per million galaxies. And if we were to expand out and meet them, it would be in roughly a billion years. So pretty rare, long time from now, but that sort of gives more fleshy numbers to the great filter concept that something is in the way. Great. Um, that, that's kind of nice that you tied that, you know, concept from earlier in your career together with one that, you know, that you just came out and was it like that year, uh, two years ago now, Gabriel Alien, maybe two. Um, yeah, right. So I, I just morning. realized basically I'd read a paper and I, it's about what's neglected. <laughs> So I, I read a paper and I noticed there was this power law that had been neglected because a paper basically said, oh, this power law would imply this. That's kind of crazy. And they just left it at that. And I said, no, 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 <laughs> that power law is real. And it has big effects of people that are neglecting it. And so I went back to uh, make sure that worked out the implications of that power law. And I still think there's other areas where the implications of that power law haven't been uh, sufficiently respected. So a general oh, well, intellectual well, strategy well, is well, to well, find well, neglected well, things. Go ahead, uh, Alison. What, what are other areas in which uh, people aren't really following the polo? Panspermia. So, um, so this power law is about how the chance of advanced life appearing depends on how long it's been since it got started. And the key idea is there's a set of hard steps to go through and the chance of appearing goes as a power law of time where the power is the number of those hard steps. And that's just a straightforward implication of the standard uh, hard steps model. Uh, and so in sort of our model of gravity aliens, it means that al the alien civilization's appear is a power law of time in the history of the universe. But if you ask about the panspermia hypothesis, so the, the key idea is there's two hypotheses. One, life appeared on earth, took 4 billion years to get to where we are, and uh, that's the end. The other hypothesis is there was some other planet before Earth, life maybe developed 4 billion years there, transferred from there to here, and then continued here. So there's two relative factors in, the, in comparing those two hypotheses. One of them is how unlikely is it that something could leave one planet and land on another? So Rocks are hitting planets all the time, kicking stuff up, but it's really pretty hard for them to drift a long way and land on another planet. That's, that's a hard thing. So that counts against the hypothesis, right? But the other thing that counts on the other side is that you get at least twice as much time for uh, a life to evolve. And if time isn't very important, then that just doesn't add much to that hypothesis. But with this power law, the time adds a lot. So we see, say, roughly six steps on Earth. If there had been another planet before, maybe there were another six steps there for, say, a total of 12 steps. And now the power law says the relative, you know, probability of a hypothesis goes as the time it had to the power 12. So that means if we had twice as much time, that hypothesis gets boosted by two to the 12, i.e. 4,000. So the power law, you know, gives you an extra boost of a factor of 4,000 to the panspermia hypothesis which, you know, should make you take it a little more seriously. Long explanation, sorry. No, that was very useful. And, you know, I mean, even if we buy all of this uh, from Grimmy Aliens, let's say, then does it make any difference to our lives right now? Like, I think that on one uh, overcoming bias post, I think you wrote something like, it's not like we, you know, have ultimate freedom about what we do with the, uh, the infinite amount of the universe, but we have like this kind of like boxed freedom. <laughs> uh, we can... We, we can shape it up to a certain point because it's a million a galaxies for the next billion years. I mean, you know, that's at least you got that. You could influence things after that, but you're that's pretty much what you're guaranteed to have to yourself. You thought it was a hundred billion years and a trillion galaxies. I'm so sorry. It's only a million galaxies for a billion years. Cut back on your ambitions, you know, cover your head with shame, tail between your legs. I'm so sorry, but it's not as big as you thought. I, I think I'll take that. Um, so what, and then once we meet them, um, can we say anything about the game theory of what it would look like to cooperate with them? Like I know that uh, Critch has a really wonderful theory, open source game theory, and there's a few others. Like I think Anders has thought about this a little bit. Like, do you have any thoughts on this? Like if we wanted to not only have this uh, limited amount, but we would actually want to survive when we meet them, uh, 
how can we make sure that we're so, so, so most likely technology would have stagnated by that, i.e. run up against fundamental limits. So you and they would be at roughly the same technology levels wherever you met them. Um, there would be this key parameter of the relative power of offense to defense. So if it just turned out defense was easier than offense, then you would expect a truce and uh, a stalemate because, you know, it's just so much easier to defend. And that would just be the end of that. If it turned out offense was powerful relative to defense, now you're going to expect conflict unless you can find a way to make peace. And so then there'd be a lot of focus on how can you make peace? So I, th I think it's pretty clear, you know, you won't see them until nearly they're here, but that might be at least, you know, hundred million years <laughs> that you'll see them coming. So you'll, you'll certainly see warning signs a long way off and people will be really anxious about this meeting. And so, uh, they would be anxious for whatever data they could get to judge like the intentions and plans and inclinations of the other side so that they could look for a way to coordinate for peace or maybe pretend for peace and undermine them and sneak, sneak attack them, whatever our inclinations are at the time, but you'd really want to know a lot about them. <laughs> and so there's two key ways we would know about them. We would just look through our telescopes and see their expanding sphere coming toward us and try to look in detail at what we can see there. They would of course expect that, but maybe they can't do that much about what they are. And we would see, you know, all the wars behind the lines. We would say hey, they must be pretty warlike if they're still got wars we can see going on after a billion years. Uh, that would be, you know, one main piece of data. And the other main piece of data would be, um, there's going to be more quiet than gravity civilizations out there. There's going to be more civilizations that will appear. So major, imagine that ratio is 10 to one or a thousand to one. That means before you hit your first gravity alien civilization, if it's a thousand one, you will have seen a roughly a thousand quiet civilizations along the way. And some of those will ones they have seen too. So they can serve as coordination points. You, you'll sort of get a sense of the range of histories of all the alien civilizations through these quiet ones. And uh, you'll use that to judge what they might be like. And uh, presumably, you know, they'll just have coordination and technologies far superior to ours. I don't think it's really the right time to figure out that strategy. <laughs> but I, I would I, I actually turn it around. I think it's I think it's a mistake to think about it just mainly in terms of the conflict that might happen at the border. I think you should think, okay, we'd meet them in a billion years, and then we'd have another hundred billion years at least of community of all the grabby alien civilizations and all the quiet ones that didn't get destroyed, learning from each other and maybe copying from each other. That is uh, deciding who they respect, deciding who has something worth emulating. And we should aspire to be respected by that community and find half things that some of them emulate about us. So that we are, this is in a sense, the gods at the end of history, <laughs> judging our civilization by what they find valuable in us, where they've copy. And that seems, you know, a pretty high aspirational goal to have. And I think I would rather people thought about that. I, I would rather they sort of think, I hope we survive. I hope we choose to go out and, you know, accomplish something. And then I hope compared to a thousand other alien civilizations, we earn someone's respect. We, we are pariahs thinking, out there. We are, you know, something of interest. But, but, but you wrote also a lot about value drift and the fact that, you know, like more progress is not like STEM progress and so forth. And so is there really anything that we can already uh, kind of gauge about what they could possibly find of interest in us? Um, I think to most people who are in futurism, it seems like this con this issue of how our values will change over time is, is sort of an overwhelming focus. So, uh, <laughs> you know, some of your interview questions here are about, you know, whether we're optimistic or pessimistic. And I would say I'm, we're I'm, not there yet, Robin, don't break the head. Okay. But I'm optimistic about our technologies, but the, the value is the part that most people find grounds for pessimism. Uh, but if you want to pause on that, we'll wait for that. Okay, well then, I I just want to do one more thing just before I hand it over to Beatrice to dig into the optimism bit, um, which is, is there any way that you know you can tie all all of the different fields that you've contributed to together? Like, let's just say, you know, do, do M's have any kind of role? Do they play a role in the gravity alien scenario? And if so, in what way does it change? And are prediction markets then just a way for like you know getting us closer to these worlds? Like, how do the various fields that you contributed to? mesh, if at all, like do you have any cohesive 
narrative and so an overview of the overview of people. Usually the best way to find out what you are is to meet a foreigner and see how you're different from them. That is when you're in your familiar world, you, it's the, you know, ocean you swim and you seem like you're natural there and you are different. It's when you see people who are really different from you and that's what shows you what you are. So uh, recently I started this podcast with a philosopher named Agnes Callard, and we call it Minds Almost Meeting because we've really struggled to see the other one's point of view. We, we come with such different attitudes and backgrounds that um, it's hard. And that's given me a lot of insight into what I am and what makes my background and toolkit different than others is uh, shown through the light of seeing that high contrast. And so I have to say the biggest contrast I see in that difference there is that um, I've learned all these systems of thought and she hasn't. <laughs> that is, she's learned logic, say, and sort of general reasoning, but I learned like thermodynamics and algorithms and uh, economics. And, you know, there's just all these systems of thought statistics. And, you know, if you look at Age of M, my book on great emulations, I'm just drawing from all those systems. <laughs> to paint a picture where I take from these systems, their basic predictions. And a lot of intellectuals out there don't know very many systems. Maybe they know one or two, uh, but if you learn a lot of systems that you can draw from a lot of them to do a lot of things and find the way that, you know, tools in one system give you answers to questions that people in another have been looking at. Uh, the thing that she and I have in common, which is also pretty different from most everybody else is that you know, like many of you, we just take on the stance that we are each supposed to like take on the entirety of all the interesting questions in the world. Like we, we don't like think this is my job in this little area and other people will figure out all this other stuff. And I'm just going to keep working on sorting algorithms or whatever it is, uh, because, you know, that process leaves so many stuff neglected where nobody does it. And so if you're going to try to address the neglected stuff nobody's doing, you kind of have to take on the general task of looking at all the things that are done and saying, what's valuable, what's promising, what's missing. And that's also a pretty unusual thing, apparently, that most people don't do. Like, so I spent many years switching fields when I said, well, this field isn't quite good enough. There's more interesting questions over there. Most people don't do that. They, they fall into a field and they stick with it. And most people, if you ask them, why is their research important? They really can't tell you very much other than, well, lots of people have been doing it for a while. <laughs> they, they can't tell you like why it'll has the promise to go where it might go or why it's more promising than other options nearby because they aren't thinking in that sort of level of just being responsible for their choice at that fundamental level. Just like, look, look at all the options, choose. That's your job. So is there an area that you think is rather undervalued where you'd want more people to kind of get out of their specialization hole and maybe think about that too? I mean, most of the areas that I've gone into are things that I feel that way about, and, but a lot of them I haven't had, I haven't taken the time to go into. So I can just list areas that I've dabbled in and haven't pursued as much. Yeah. Uh, but, you um, you know, I like sort of the grand arc of history things like sort of overall explanations for large arcs in history and trying to understand those that I think those are neglected. Um, the rationality of disagreement, like why does it make sense to disagree with somebody else if they are nearly as smart and knowledgeable as you? Um, I did a lot of work in that while once I think there's a lot of promising institutional innovations. And again, the main obstacle there is more concrete experimentation, but there's really a lot of them and they really are promising and they're just sitting there waiting to be tried. Well, to the extent that uh, crypto already took on your prediction markets pioneering and like is actually trying to do that with a few of them, you know? Not but, at uh, all. And uh, I mean, they're, they're not really doing the thing I think needs to be done, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they're there. Relative what's, to the, being there. What's, the bit that, what's the bit that's missing? So, for example, in crypto, on many projects have created uh, crypto platforms where people can bet. Uh, that is, they, they say, well, you know, they make a way that you can deposit money and that you can make a topic and then you can bet for it against the topic and trade on that. And then if you were right, you win. If you're wrong, you lose. And so a lot of people, there's a dozen maybe of those projects out there of people have made these places where people can bet. And there's now 
several of them right now. You can go right, right now uh, yourself. So there's a uh, Kalishi, which is non-crypto, but then there's, um, I, I have a web, I actually have a talk I gave recently, I gave a long list of these things, but basically I would say the problem there is what you really, the, the real customer in this area is people who have decisions that uh, need advice. Whereas these markets are mostly going for the customer or somebody who just wants to speak their mind through the mechanism of bet. Cause they're basically, you bet there and then there's an overhead and a tax that goes, you know, paying for the whole system. And the benefit you get is you just get to speak your mind and show that you are right. If you are right, or take a chance in doing that. And that's a valuable thing, but it's just, you know, that's not how most organizations work. Most organizations work because, you know, there's somebody essentially responsible for decisions and then they have resources to ask for advice and, and do analysis to support their decisions. And then decisions are taken that are valuable in order for the organization. And most organizations do not rely very much on a crowd of people who want to speak their mind about whatever topic they're interested in. That's just not how it works. And so what we need is for people to, to develop particular applications that would support decision makers and then go through the trouble of, you know, working out the details and making a track record showing that they work so that you could convince decision makers of a certain kind that this is a good source to help them with their decision. And if you can do that, you know, there's trillions of dollars of value here because there's trillions of dollars of value out there in making better decisions. Um, but yeah. nobody wants to, very few people want to be the first person who like tries it out when it's not working very well and hasn't been tested because they'd rather wait till somebody else does that. And that's what we're waiting for. Well, yeah. And at that point, I guess, um, prediction markets will turn to decision markets, but just like a newer term I think that, um, you're putting in there. Okay. So, uh, I think I've spoken my piece here. We've uh, kind of like at least surveyed a bunch of the different fields that you're engaged in. And so now Beatrice can take you and, uh, see if you, uh, you know, are interested in putting on a more like positive lens on things. If you, you know, want to venture out there and make specific predictions about what a positive future could look like, but yeah, this was wonderful already. And, um, I think that people are like warmed up. Yeah, let's uh, let's try to actually do some prediction. Um, yeah, so so like a big part of this podcast is about trying to um, show that there hopefully are things to get excited about for the future, um, and to get a bit concrete about trying to envision the future in hopefully a positive way. Um, and you seem to have done a lot of thinking on what the future will look like. So I'm very curious to hear your answers on this. Um, and like these more slightly philosophical questions. So I'll just start with asking you if you would describe yourself as optimistic about the future. I think I would, but honestly, that's more of a value description than a outcome description. So, it, so there's, as I said with Allison, there's, there's two key questions people tend to have thinking about the future. One is they ask whether sort of we'll continue with economic and technical growth of sort we've seen in the past and how long will that last and how fast will it be and how far can it go? And I think a great many people, including like some of my colleagues, they have this intuition that the world couldn't possibly change in the future as much as it changed in the past <laughs> because they just see this enormous change in the past and they look to the future and they say, they just couldn't see how that could possibly happen in the future. It just, it just couldn't be. So they, implicitly think we're at the end of history in terms of economic and technical changes. That that's how a great many ordinary people see the future. And I think that's just wrong that we, that is, if you understand the more technical details of what's possible, we, you should expect as much change in the future as you've seen in the past, which is therefore a lot and as much growth and therefore you should just robustly expect an enormous growth in the economy and technical ability in the future, you know, if we don't kill ourselves, which is a risk, but it's, you know, certainly more likely to not happen than to happen. Um, but it's well worth attending to. So that's optimism. If, if you like, that is relative to most people's just myopic sort of that couldn't possibly happen. I think it's pretty obvious that it could really large, really big change. That is even just continuing the same rates of change. So the world economy has been doubling every 15 years for a century or two now, and I can continue. It's like, so, you know, if you do that for 150 years, you've got 10 doublings or a factor of a thousand. 
and that's not crazy to expect another 150 years. Uh, and you know, that means a huge changes, but once you convince most people that that's actually a likely thing, they don't necessarily think that's optimistic because what they're worried about is, will I like this strange world <laughs> or respect it, or do I be repelled and horrified by this strange world? And so then what people mean about optimism is what do I think about the strange world? Now I have seen, I mean, how different the past was. So I think most people are fooled by history and historical fiction because they don't realize how different the past really was. The past really was more different than you see in most historical fiction. The characters really were more different. Their attitudes and habits of life were really more different than you see. The past was really different. And that's the strongest thing to make you realize the future is probably going to be really different. You don't actually need all the technology and futurism to realize the future will probably be really different if you just see how big different the past was. And not only was the they were different in many habits, they were different in values. Past people had different values. They, they had different priorities. They love some things you hate and they hate some things you love. And so now you have a question about your stance toward that. I, I should say you should expect that in the future. And in fact, my book, The Age of M basically realizes that. So I would say my book, The Age of M about uh, the possibility of regulation, what works out there. There's lots of details, but the highest level bit is just, it's as strange as you should have expected <laughs> had you looked at how strange the past was and projected that forward. The, the particular strangenesses, maybe you couldn't have predicted, but the, the degree of strangeness and the degree to which their values differ from yours are roughly at the level you should have expected. And so now optimism then comes down to the question, is that okay? <laughs> is it okay? if their values are that different from yours. And the part of that's related to, is it okay that the past was as different from yours, right? And so I will say I'm an optimist in the sense that it's okay for me with me. When I look at the age of M and I say, that's an okay world. I can see them valuing their lives there and living fulfilling lives there, even if their values are different to mine, but other people are more stuck on, well, these are the way things are and, and we want them to be better. So over the last few centuries, we've seen some consistent trends and a lot of say science fiction continues to project those trends forward. So say the cultural novels or Star Trek, they, um, they take our last few century historical trends in attitudes and values that they project them forward. And a lot of people are really attached to that idea <laughs> that the future will be more like we are relative to the past along those trend lines. And so, you know, as you, you know, standard trends we've seen in the last few centuries, increasing per capita wealth, increasing leisure, increasing rights and scope of uh, moral circles, uh, less religion, less fertility, more promiscuity, more travel, more leisure, more art, um, um, less war. These are some of the major trends of the last few centuries. And a lot of people, when you project those trends forward, they go, yeah, that's great. because. <laughs> Those are the values they have, and they want more of that. And age of M and my larger analysis says not so fast. Um, you, you can't reliably predict that to continue over the long run. What you should more expect is just strangeness and change. A long answer. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It was a long answer, but very, very interesting. Um, yeah, so you seem to be fine with the strangeness that's coming. So uh, yeah, I would <laughs> interpret that as being optimistic. Um, so I, in terms of like, what makes you feel excited about the future? And um, is there anything in particular? And could you share maybe a vision of since this is the existential hope podcast of existential hope for the future? I honestly think I am just excited by size. So there's a trope in science fiction called the big dumb object. And there are a number of science fiction stories and even movies where in fact, much of the emotional energy comes from a big dumb object. Think of ring world, this huge ring around the sun or a Star Trek movie where they fly around the new spaceship and go, ooh, and ah, right? How big and shiny it is, right? I, I like science fiction. I got to admit, I just like the idea that our future world will be big, uh, really big with 
all of these little parts doing all of these different things where in each tiny part of this huge thing, there's some people there living their lives, having interesting stories, making, adding to the part of it, and then adding to this whole huge thing. And that just excites me. And uh, I had this strange dream once that I, I described in my preface to uh, Age of M with once a long time ago, I was just dreaming about sort of this future world in some vast city. And all I could really see in this vast city was one person in their little place they lived and the little things they had, but I could just sense how huge it all was. And that gave me hope that the world would be full of little people with little lives in a vast world of moral. But I can't tell you why that's good per se. I, that's just more of an axiom for me, I guess. I think that's a, it's a very good answer still. You're obviously very excited about this future. And also it's like the groundness, I think a lot of people can, can connect to, um, at least I feel excited. Um, so I think you wanted to jump into this question before, which was that, um, you know, it's, it's hard for people to sort of envision positive scenarios of the future, uh, which I guess ties into to your answer also in terms of the optimistic question, but um, do you want to touch on that again on why you think it's hard, like it's easier for us to envision what we would consider dystopias um, than what we would consider maybe utopias? It, it seems to me like in discussion about things, emotional energy just gets attracted to the negative scenarios and the negative possibilities. So if, if you look at say most discussion of politics, there's very little discussion of like exciting, positive possibilities. It's almost entirely about like problems and, and things that might go wrong and, and what we might do about that. I mean, that's just overwhelming. And that's, you know, also most science fiction and futurist goes that way. Uh, and so in the early days of the Foresight Institute, uh, you know, nanotechnology was one of the main focuses. And I think we saw this interesting phenomena where you know, Drexler described great hopeful changes that would be possible with nanotechnology. And he also described some things that go wrong and almost all the public discussion was focused on the things that go wrong. So much so that when the government decided to have a project like using that name, they just distanced themselves entirely from all the positive things because they thought it was associated with all, associated in some way vaguely with the negative things. And that's just, you know, something to why honestly, I, so this is a trope of science fiction. And I think is actually true of a lot of futurism, a trope of science fiction says most science fiction is really an allegory about the present. It's an indirect way to raise issues about the present through the indirect alternative world of the future. It's not really about the future. People don't really care about the future. They really care about their world and sort of indirect allegories. Um, that is actually a pretty good description for most science fiction. And a pretty good description for most futurism. Uh, you might say like all the things that can happen in the future, the thing that grabs people most is global warming, like which happens on a scale of two centuries when like hundreds of other really big things are likely to happen. So why, why all this focus on global warming? We might say, because that has a morality tale they can get behind for today. Too much materialism, something like that, right? And then, then it's really about today in you know, indirectly describing the future. So, um, if you actually, you know, realize this pattern and actually start to think about the future people in their own terms and ask, how do they see their world? Then I think you just think a lot of, a lot of these things differently. Yeah. Um, you've touched on sci-fi a few times, uh, in this conversation. Um, is there anything in particular that you would recommend someone you know, getting into to futurism or any of your fields, uh, since you have so many of them, um, that they should like read. Um, That's really you... hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you're young and you're interested in like big grand things, science fiction is very exciting because it describes this exciting possibilities of the future. The more you learn about the moral, the more you realize that science fiction authors haven't been bothering to be accurate with respect to a bunch of other more realistic issues because their readers don't know any better and why should they bother? So the more you learn, the less most science fiction makes sense, even as a weak analog or allegory for the kinds of future changes are coming. It's mostly just has almost nothing to do with the future. Uh, and that's sad. 
uh, because it was fun for a while, right? And so I, I just really reluctant to point to anything very concrete that I think that does a decent job um, because hardly anything does. Uh, I, I would look at sort of more serious analysis, honestly, uh, and just enjoy the science fiction for entertainment. Um, but I do, th so one of the main functions science fiction does provide is just stretching scenarios. So m one of the main ways people write science fiction is to find a scenario that just stretches your, some concepts in some way, like that defies your expectations. It forces you to make a decision you usually don't have to make. Like if you see it, you know, you usually have a rule about humans and a rule about animals. They show you a human animal combination and you say, I dare you to decide what to do about it. And so I think science fiction does serve a nice role for those sorts of thought experiments. They aren't describing the future per se. They're more showing you that there could be examples that defy your categories and asking you to maybe generalize your approach so that you could be more robust to such things. And I think that's a general thing that futurism forces you to do. It, you know, once you start to see all these things that could happen, you say, well, my usual rules of treating things don't even allow for this category. <laughs> and I'm making assumptions about distinctions that won't be key distinctions in the future. And I need to back off and just come up with a more general approach to things like that. So that doesn't need to forecast the future accurately at all to serve the function of making you realize there are possibilities <laughs> that your usual analysis hasn't allowed for. Well, I, I think yeah, then I can take the opportunity to recommend Age of M as a, an interesting read <laughs> uh, in relation to this. Um, it's not science fiction, but it's, it's like a, science fiction, except there's no plot and there's no characters and it all makes sense, would be my point. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, last part is the hard part you see for most science fiction, having it all pulled together makes sense. But... It, it's very hard to make sense, <laughs> definitely, uh, in general. Um, okay, I think I have to hand you back over to Allison for like the last questions. Um... Yeah, thanks, Petri. Um, I love hearing that. And, you know, I think, I don't know, like hopeful vision for modern art are always an interesting one just because I think that, you know, you have your hand in both and uh, many different fields. Okay. Uh, so at the end of this meeting, what we always usually do is we ask a few questions around um, a little bit more of a concrete story prompt that other people can engage in. And so that's the time. Um, so there is a concept, uh, you know, I'm sure that, you know, you're probably familiar with the paper on existential hope where uh, Toby Autumn owned Cotton Barrett and uh, introduced the concept of a youth catastrophe, like an event after which the expected value of the rest of the universe, whatever that may mean is much higher um, than before. And so, A, do you have a better term for this? Because we're looking for one. Um, do you have one? Um, good stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, wins, uh, you know, I resume, I guess I would have to think about a better term for that. But yeah, do you just want like grand good events that uh, innovations, advances, uh, breakthroughs, breakthroughs might be the best sort of words, like somehow we broke through a barrier and then therefore things are more promising on the other side. Okay. I love it. I also just like good stuff. Um, um, well, <laughs> we'll definitely take that into account. Second one is, you know, if you think about such an event, um, could you maybe describe one? Like, could you uh, come up with a concrete scenario that would look like a new catastrophe for you? Like. I think Christine uh, Peterson at our first meeting, uh, where it was reviving a frozen dog, uh, that would tell us that. Right, so I, I, I could definitely work. tell lots of positive events. So certainly a, a, a substantial progress toward reviving cryonics patients would be one, but honestly, just a much larger increase in the number of customers would be one. That is, I, I still find it quite sad that in fact, most of the world doesn't have to die. <laughs> and wouldn't die if only there were enough customers for cryonics. And there would be, if, if a million, if suddenly, you know, within a short time, if there were a million, 10 million customers, that would just be a whole other world. And that would be really great. Clearly say the, the, the first working cheap enough brain emulation would herald this new age of M that I read about my book, which I think would be overall good. The first, you know, effective interstellar colony ship that heads out and plausibly will, you know, expand, 
lead to this sort of indefinite, indefinite expansion of our civilization. That would be one. And I have these sort of ideas for social reforms. And if they were just any, any substantial experiment of one of those on a, on a small scale that seems successful, that would also be wonderful because then it could lead to larger versions of them. Um, Give us a few ideas. Well, like decision markets. Like if the, I have this fire the CEO proposal where basically you make markets on each company in the stock price conditional the CEO staying or leaving. If you had those markets on the Fortune 500 running for five years, you'd collect data showing that the markets, the companies who followed the advice did better than the others. You could then sue boards of directors to follow the advice and change corporate accountability in a few years for a few million dollars and start at the top. And if you legitimize it for that decision, it would become legitimate for lots of smaller decisions. And that would sort of break open a breakthrough, basically. I like, I like breakthrough. <laughs> break open oh. the possibilities there. And I would find that very inspiring. You also like breakouts. I remember when, um, I think it was an Alex Friedman podcast, you mentioned basically that, you know, you're rather worried about a world government that could lock us in uh, on earth and that likely um, the types of aliens that we may need uh, could potentially uh, be a few, well, or, or couldn't really be a few that uh, just escaped. Um, but but then at least for us, there's a real possibility that, you know, we may or may not just have to do the escape route. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Like what worries me so much about it? Is there perhaps another you that either you can imagine of like how we could, may avoid uh, this, you know, right. value lock by one? I think you're right that breakout is a subset of breakthrough. <laughs> and it interestingly connotes the idea that one of the important breakthroughs is to break out, to escape some sort of controls that you might otherwise face. So um, I, I do think as you've probably heard before, but the rest of them may not have, that probably the biggest decision humanity will ever face is whether to allow interstellar colonists. And you might think it's an obvious decision. And, you know, my job in writing my book and talking to you is to show you how it's not so obvious that a lot of people will have a deep emotional attachment to not allowing that. Because over the next few centuries, we will continue to have stronger global governance and stronger global communities that creates more a coordination and convergence of regulation around the world. And that legitimately solves important problems that people care about, including war and global warming and, you know, overfishing and innovation and all sorts of big problems will be solved in part by basically having, if not a world government, a world mob that effectively makes the whole world do what they say. And people will like that. And when they finally realize that if they allow an interstellar colony ship to go off without, you know, strong political officers on board to make sure they follow the center commands, uh, that's the end of this era. That is, we would then return to an era of competition and conflict and evolution that would be out of control and would mean the civilization that spread out would no longer have a central governance that decided things together. It could no longer expose, the center could no longer expose its will in the periphery. And they may just not want to allow that. And I think part of it is really just how evolution and competition would change our descendants. I, we haven't talked so much about that, but I think that is one of the biggest fears people have. It's not just that there's conflict, but that evolution would select for new values, new attitudes, new mental styles to make our descendants aliens to us. And that's one of the things I think a world government will do limiting changes like genetic engineering, et cetera, because people find that icky. Um, yeah, and, I would say that I think in world government with collective suicide or something like that, like it's one of your posts, and you basically say that it would be an, uh, a curious answer to the great filter if by being so worried about destroying ourselves, <laughs> Over expanding, we actually end up destroying ourselves by locking ourselves in. Um, and yeah, I think that is actually like a, a pretty likely possibility. Like, just given, I think. So, so know, here's a metaphor I, I want to just take a minute a, a metaphor that I like for this change issue, which is the standard hypothetical transporter, a Star Trek transporter. So, you know, many people in philosophy classes have this long discussion. Okay, you know, they take apart your atoms here, they read them, they put up together a new set of atoms over there, the same arrangement. Is that really you? And then after an hour's discussion in an you know, undergraduate philosophy class, the students are about 50-50 split on, is that thing coming out me or not? And then they get really you know, worried about it. But if you ask the same question another way, they all agree. The, the other way to ask the question is, you just walked out of the transporter. Is the thing that walked in you? And everybody goes, oh, yeah, well, 
that, yeah, that was me. <laughs> it's not sure that the thing that will walk out on the other side in the future is you, but it's clear to them that the thing that walked into the past was them. And I think that's a good metaphor for how when we look toward the future, we are just not so sure we want to endorse all the strange things that would happen. But when we look in our past, we find enormous continuity between ourselves and our ancestors. We think, well, they weren't that different than us. And, you know, we feel very kinship, strong kinship with them. And I think that's how it will work in the future. That is, however weird our ancestors will be, become the M's or interstellar colonists, and they will change a lot. They will still think their essence hasn't changed. <laughs> they will still look back at us and say, we weren't that different, even if we look at them and go, yes, you were. Yeah, that's a really lovely metaphor. Um, okay, we're pretty much at the end of this. Um, two minutes left. Okay, let's do uh, one question, which is, what is the best advice you ever got? And if we have time for another, uh, we'll try to sneak another one in. But uh, this is, I think, the one where it's always a cheesy question, but the answers that we get are usually really good. I'm going to disappoint you this time because I don't have a good answer. I don't know what advice I... I mean, you know, for example... When I was going for tenure, uh, I was doing all these interesting things like Great Filter and my colleagues came to me and said, if you want to get tenure, you need to focus on economics for a while and just do the standard stuff. And later on, you can do other weird stuff. And I took that advice and I got tenure. That was like pretty effective, right? Getting tenure was, it was a big deal. And I've been able to spend, you know, decades after that doing all the stuff I want to. So that in terms of practical advice that I heard and followed, that was very effective. And for most people, whatever problems you're really interested in, they'll they'll be around 10 years from now. So if you can do something in the next 10 years to set yourself up for the rest of your life to study whatever you want, however you want, that's a pretty good investment if you can okay, delay gratification. That's a wonderful segue into the final question, which uh, I think I saw the Beatrice going to ask it earlier. I I'm going to try to stick it in here now. Uh, saying that, you know, the most problems will still be around in 10 years is assuming that your AI timelines are longer than that. Uh, do you want to say a few words about uh, your AI timelines, your worries about AI, how does that factor into any of our chances for uh, positive features? Very quickly. So uh, I did this recent um, statistical analysis of all the jobs in the U.S. from 1999 to 2019 and how automated each job was in each year and looked at what were the determinants of automation, uh, which turned out to be very sort of classical, very, very, you know, seat of the pants sort of things you would think of for very old style automation, how much automation had changed by a third of a standard deviation. Did the determinants of automation change over time? And it is, have we seen a revolution in the kind? And the answer is just no. Same exact determinants 20 years later as before. And was there any correlation with changes in wages or number of workers and no correlation whatsoever? So that says to me over the last 20 years, there was basically no change in the nature of automation and only modest change in the quantity. And that's basically what's been going on for many, many decades. And so we've seen roughly every 30 years, a burst of a lot of anxiety and concern about automation and AI under the scenario that like, could this time be different? Because I think most people in the back of their mind have this idea, eventually something will be different and it'll really change. And is it this time? And every 30 years, people talk about that. And of course, so far every 30 years, it hasn't happened. And that's the truth right now at the moment, it hasn't happened. And I got to project that forward for another few 30 year cycles. I don't see any, I don't, I'm not, I don't see good indications that now it's about to be different. Yes, eventually it'll be different, but I uh, just some, some raw long-term stats that says that'll probably won't be in the next 30 years, probably won't even be in the next 60 years. But, um, but a lot of people are impressed. I think with what you'd call an inside view, looking at recent demos and what exactly they can do. And all I can tell you, look, I was fooled that way long ago. So I was a grad student in physics. And, and uh, philosophy of science. And I read cool stuff about AI demos and hyped articles saying, look, the AI revolution was here. And I believed that in 1984. And I had often joined the AI field uh, as a result of that, inspired by the idea that we were near the point where it'll all take over and all change. And of course it didn't happen then. I was just wrong. And I think just consistently over the decades, people are just over impressed with new demos. <laughs> When they see a, a capability of machine that no machine has ever done before, and it seems such a, like a central part of human nature, they go, wow, it could play chess, or wow, it could do Jeopardy, or wow, it could drive a car. And they just go, we must be almost there. And no, that's, we're just bad at that. You just realize, stop, stop. We're, we're just, 
you're just bad at using your intuition about a demo to say that must be near the core of what, but, what it takes I mean, to do you, us. But even if you think that eventually we get there, right? So the long-term view uh, of our views in space, even if you don't think we have short timelines, they must be AI infused on forms. I mean, to the extent that of course, M's certainly are. But, you know, I do think that M's would be more likely to appear first than full human level AI. And I also think we're just going to get plenty of warning. Uh, I just don't see AI as the sort of thing that it suddenly surprises you with vast increases in capacities, because that's just not what we've seen in the past. Um, if you just look at computer science and technology overall, we you just really get plenty of warning about most substantial big increases in capacities. Uh, most innovation is small fluctuations. Uh, there are big fluctuations, but they're rare. We actually see relatively steady trains and trends and technical abilities and progress over long time periods, including in computer science. So um, I think emulations are actually more likely to be a disruptive thing. I know that doesn't mean that we wouldn't get lots of warning, but just having half an emulation is pretty useless. <laughs> Having like uh, an AI at half of human abilities, that could be pretty useful because it's you know, been designed to be useful, but an emulation is only really useful if it all works and half yeah. an emulation is, is useless. So you'd have more of a disruptive transition introducing emulations than you would sort of classical AI, but um, still, I think in both cases, we'll get lots of warning. I would say, you know, uh, we can eventually see if hard takeoff or soft takeoff uh, is um, panned out, uh, which way it panned out. But obviously, if you're wrong, there's no one there to hold accountable. <laughs> and we can only hold you accountable if you've been right. <laughs> so that's good for you. Um, I think, yeah, I think this is a wonderful way to end it. Uh, thank you so, so much for coming. I know that we kind of like stumbled across a variety of different fields. Uh, there's no other way, to, I think, to do this with you because uh, otherwise I would always have FOMO that I uh, left one important topic out. Um, thank you so, so much uh, for everyone joining. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you all uh, very soon.